Hi everyone, my name is Andrew, and in this video, you're gonna learn why you can trust the Bible. The facts I get to share with you today are the things that helped me grow in my faith when I was first starting out. Now, I've been a pastor for about 20 years and done hundreds of hours of research, and I know how hard it is to get real information about the Bible. So, I am super excited to share some historic details about why we can trust the Bible today. Now, years ago, when I was in college, I got invited to a church a lot like The Crossing, our church. And it was here that I got introduced to faith in Jesus. And at that church, I was encouraged to begin to open this book, known as the Bible, and read and study its words. Now, one of the first books I read was the book of Luke, a book that claims to be an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus, which is great and helpful, except at that exact same moment in time, I had a professor at my school who was a great guy, incredibly insightful and funny and engaging, who taught world history. And pretty often, he would make these kind of jabs at organized religion, specifically Christianity. He would regularly say things like, the Bible has been changed throughout the centuries, or the Bible was put together by people in power who were trying to control the regular people, or the Bible is full of myths and superstition. Now, maybe you've had a similar experience of getting excited about faith and God and then having someone in a position of authority claim this whole thing is made up. Years ago, there was a group of people known as the Jesus Seminar. They claimed to be preeminent scholars of the Bible, and they went through and voted on every word Jesus spoke. And they would vote, did Jesus say this or no? And at the end, their conclusion was about 80% 80% of what we see in the four Gospels or biographies of Jesus, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they claim that 80% was made up, was fiction, was a myth. They even put out their own version of the Bible, which was, obviously, considerably shorter. Or maybe you read The Da Vinci Code for a few years back or saw the movie. One of the main characters in The Da Vinci Code makes this claim. He says, the Bible is a product of man, not of God. It has evolved through countless translations, editions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version of the book. The idea here is the Bible cannot be trusted. Now, some of these critics, they can be easily disregarded. The Jesus Seminar included such scholars as Paul Verhoeven, who directed the movies Robocop and Showgirls, uh, which I loved Robocop back in the day, but hard to think that that qualifies you as a biblical scholar. The Da Vinci Code is a fun book, engaging, but it is a fiction book. Even the author Dan Brown will tell you that. But this question continues to be asked in our day. Can we trust the Bible? More recently, an author by the name of Bart Ehrman made the rounds on Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert and NPR and the History Channel with his book, Misquoting Jesus. He even has a YouTube channel that just a couple of months ago released an episode titled, Your Bible Has Been Corrupted that was, has been viewed 196,000 times. And his basic argument is as follows. He says, the Bible has been changed. The Bible has been edited. In fact, Bart Ehrman is famous for saying, there are more variants in the New Testament than there are words. Now, a variant is when you have two copies of a document and you put them side by side and you just count up the differences between them. These are the variants. So the idea here is that the Bible has suffered the same fate as every kid who ever played the telephone game. You remember that game, right? You start off with a message, but as that message gets passed from kid to kid, it gets changed and edited, and eventually it doesn't even resemble the original. And today, that is how most people view the Bible, that it has been changed and edited so many times that we can't possibly know what's true and what's not. So today, here's what I want to do. I want to unpack the two most important questions about the Bible. Number one, can we trust this book? Can we trust it? And number two, does it matter? Now, today I'm so excited because if you have these questions about the Bible, then this message is for you. And if you don't, I promise you have friends and families that are asking this question today. So here's what is in store for you. This talk is gonna be a little technical. We got a lot of ground to cover and I'm gonna ask you to stop whatever else you're doing and maybe take a few notes right now. And I want to, of course, give credit where credit is due for this talk. I am deeply indebted to a church in Atlanta that has run a few messages on the Bible called Passion City. 
and I am deeply indebted to an author by the name of John Ortberg and his book, Who Is This Man? And I also wanna refer back to a talk I gave about a year ago in this series called The Genius of Jesus. If you missed it or don't remember, I wanna encourage you to go back and watch this as well because these two messages, they tie in together. So let's jump in. Question one, can we trust this book? To evaluate the authenticity of an ancient manuscript like the Bible, what historians will usually do is they ask two questions. First, how many copies of it do we have? And second, are the dates of the original copies close to the original manuscript? Now, here's the idea. The idea being that since we never have the originals of any ancient book, because paper disintegrates over time, we all know that, the question then becomes how many copies of this original manuscript do we have? And then let's look at the dates of those copies. For example, probably all of you have heard of Plato. He lived a few centuries before Jesus. He was a famous philosopher. He wrote The Republic. So today, we have seven copies of his work. We don't have the original, just seven copies. The earliest copy we have is from 1,000 years after his life. Meaning, from the time of Plato, when he lived and when he died, we have this thousand year gap between his life and our earliest copy. So today, scholars, they wrestle with, did any changes or edits occur during that huge gap of a thousand years when Plato lived in our first copy? Or here's another one from around the time of Jesus. We have a historian known as Livy. He wrote all about the Roman Empire. So pretty much any movie you've ever seen about the Roman Empire, most of what we know, it comes from his works. We have 27 copies of his work. And our earliest copy is from 400 years after his life. So with him, we have a lot more copies and a much shorter gap of time. Now that's a good thing, historically speaking. Let me give you one more. Some of you in high school, you probably read the Iliad. It's written by Homer. It's the story of Achilles and the Trojan horse. Great story. Now, the Iliad is a unique historical document because we have over 1,000 copies of the Iliad. This is an unbelievable amount. And the earliest copy we have is from 400 years after his life. Now, I'm guessing, if you read the Iliad, that at no point did you have a teacher who said, well, class, here's the thing. We don't actually know what's in the Iliad. Maybe Achilles doesn't die, or maybe there is no Trojan horse. We can't possibly know. And here's why no one ever said that to you. It's because the dates of the copies we have how close they are to the original date of the document, it makes this credible. Likewise, no one questions whether or not the Roman Empire was real because we have sources like Livy. Does this make sense? More copies and the closer to the original, the more trust we put into a document. Now, how about the Bible? Okay, for now, we're going to look at the New Testament of the Bible. This is the life and ministry of Jesus and the early church. So the question is, how many copies of the Bible do we have? Now, if you're watching with someone, I want to encourage you, take a guess. What do you think? 10? 100? 200? Maybe 500? Okay, so the Bible was originally written in Greek. It was the most common language of the day. So let's just start with Greek copies. We have 6,000 copies or portions of the New Testament in Greek. Then, in the second century AD, about 100 years after the life of Jesus, the Bible was translated into Latin. So, we have an additional 10,000 copies in Latin. Now, from there, the Bible is copied into other languages, such as Syriac and Coptic. We have another 10,000 copies of the Bible in other languages. So, just doing a little math, right there, we have 26,000 handwritten manuscripts of the Bible. Now, just to be abundantly clear, no other document even comes close to this title, total. But what about the time frame? What kind of gap do we have between the life of Jesus and the earliest copy or portion of a copy of the New Testament? Is it 400 years like Livy or Homer, or is it closer to a thousand years like Plato? Well, the earliest manuscript of the Bible was found in Egypt in the 1920s. The archaeologists found this little piece of paper. Here's a picture of it. This is known as P52. And when they saw it, they recognized that it was from the book of John, chapter 18, where Jesus speaks to Pilate and says this. Jesus says, you say that I am a king. 
In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So these guys, they found this little document and they sent it off to be dated. And it came back to be dated within 40 or 50 years of the life of Jesus. Meaning our earliest copy of the Bible is approximately 40 years after the life of Jesus. Now here's why this is so incredibly significant. You cannot change history when there are still eyewitnesses around. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, this weekend, the video that this video airs is Super Bowl weekend. And if you've been around the crossing for a while, you know that I am from Chicago and I am a huge Bears fan. Now, about 40 years ago, the Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl. Now, imagine someone trying to rewrite history. And let's picture them saying, you know, actually, the Bears never won the Super Bowl. Could someone change that story, story in just 40 years? And the answer is, of course not. Because there are eyewitnesses that watched that game live, where my Bears crushed the Dolphins 46-10. to 10. On TV, some other people watched it. Or you could even still to this day interview the coach of the Bears, Mike Dicka, the greatest coach with the greatest mustache. And he would tell you all about that game. Or some of you will remember the greatest music video of all time, the Super Bowl Shuffle. You see, you can't change history so close to the original date. So that we have a copy of the Bible within 40 or 50 years of the life of Jesus lends huge credibility to the authenticity and accuracy of what we have here. Now, on top of that, the sheer amount of copies, 26,000 copies of the Bible, puts the Bible in a class all its own. This is why every few years someone writes a book about a secret gospel that gets found. And I don't know if you've ever heard of these. Occasionally people will talk about like the supposed gospel of Thomas or the gospel of Mary or some other book that claims to give insight into the life of Jesus. And scholars pretty instantly, they dismiss these because these secret gospels were written hundreds and hundreds of years after the life of Jesus and are pretty obvious fakes. But how do we know? The errors haven't crept into what we know today as the Bible. How do we know that the Bible hasn't, though, over the years, suffered the same fate as kids in the telephone game? Let's go back to the Bart Ehrman quote. He said, there are more variants in the New Testament than there are words. So it's great we got all these copies, but do they all line up? Do they all say the same thing? Do we actually have more variants than we do have words in the New Testament? Well, There are about 140,000 words in the New Testament. We have about 400,000 variants. So technically, the statement is true. And if that was the only thing you knew, that would, of course, be concerning. But when we put it in the context that we have 26,000 manuscripts of the Bible, it starts to make more sense. 400,000 variants over 26,000 manuscripts averages out to be about 16 variants or differences per manuscript. So a better question for us to ask is how important are these variants? For example, are there copies of the Bible where maybe Jesus doesn't die or Jesus doesn't claim to be God? Because if that was the case, this would would matter. This would call into question a lot of our core beliefs we have as Christians. So again, I'm going to get a little technical here. Because people will talk about how the Bible has been changed or there are different versions of the Bible out there. So uh, I'm going to place these variants into four categories. The first group of variants are spelling differences. For instance, in English, my name is Andrew, but you could call me Andrew or Drew or Andy. Now, all of those you could say to refer to me. Now, of course, I'll only respond to Andrew, but you could still use the others and be referring to me. Same is true in Greek. For instance, the name John is a popular name in the Bible. And at the end, in Greek, there's something called the removable new. It's just like adding an N to a name. And you could do it or not. It's just a preference in Greek. Now, 70% of the 400,000 variants are simply spelling differences, primarily for names or cities. None of them, none of them change the meaning of the text. Just like calling me Drew or Andy doesn't change who you're referring to. So just like that, 70% of these variants are just spelling. Second group is considered word order. In Greek, word order doesn't matter. 
So, for instance, let's take the sentence, Jesus loves Andrew. In Greek, you could put those three words in any order. You could write, Jesus, Andrew, love, love, Jesus, Andrew, Andrew, Jesus, love. The order doesn't change the meaning in Greek. It's the ending of the word that determines the sentence structure. Get this, that's another 29% of variants are just that, word order. Meaning, for anyone doing the math, 99% of the variants in the New Testament involve spelling and word order, which now just leaves us with the last 1%. Now, group three are variants that change the meaning of the text, but they actually don't make sense. Like, think of these as typos. For example, and this is a great illustration given by Ben Stewart at that church, Passion Church, I mentioned. He tells us that 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, Paul says, we were like young children among you. The idea here being that when Paul and his friends came to this church, they were gentle and humble. The Greek for this phrase for young children is agonathi apioi. But there is this 14th century copy of the Bible that says agonathi an apioi, which translates to we were like horses among you. You hear the difference? One little letter turns the phrase from children to horses. Now, this variant would potentially change the meaning of 1 Thessalonians 2.7, but it doesn't make any sense. It's like this. A while back, I came across this sign. Now, it's possible that this sign is saying it's okay to smoke as long as you are not loudly smoking. But what would actually make more sense is that the intent of this sign is you can't smoke. No smoking allowed. You see, the amount of variants that fall into this category of typos is 0.9%. So we have now covered 99.9% of variants, which brings us to the smallest category. These are variants that could possibly change the meaning of a passage. One of the most famous of these is found in Revelation 13, 18. It says this, it says, let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. Now, if you grew up in churches in the 80s or 90s, you probably heard about the number of the beast. And maybe you didn't grow up in church, but you loved Iron Maiden back in the day like I did. Then you also know the number of the beast is 666. However, in 1834, a scholar found an ancient manuscript of the book of Revelation, and there is this copy dated around the 5th century AD, and it says the number of the beast is not 666, but 666. One, six. Then, about 15 years ago, another manuscript from the book of Revelation was found, had about seven chapters written on it, and this manuscript also says the number of the beast is 616. So, what's the number of the beast? Is it 666 or 616? Well, honestly, we don't know. It's hard to say. You see, this is a meaningful variant that could alter how we understand the passage. Now, I know some of you who have maybe been around the church for a long time, you're feeling a little angsty right now. But here is the good news. I don't know of any church or person who has decided to base their life on the death and resurrection of Jesus and the number of the beast. You see, our faith isn't found in a number. You see, even Bart Ehrman in the appendix of his book, he says in the appendix of misquoting Jesus, he says the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants. So here's a man who has made his name writing books like Misquoting Jesus and putting out videos titled like Your Bible Has Been Corrupted. He puts in the appendix of his book, essential beliefs aren't affected. See, are you beginning to see that there is no book like this book? There is no historical document that has been so well preserved. No book has more copies. No book has as many authenticated words as this book. But here's the second question I want to hit on briefly. But does it matter? You see, today there is this common misconception that Christianity spread because of money and power in the ancient world. But history, it tells a much different story. For the first 300 years after Jesus, people in power tried their best to eliminate Christianity. They persecuted, intimidated, arrested, and killed Christians. And yet the message of Jesus continued to spread from city to city. How is that possible? Well, we get this amazing insight from a Roman emperor who spent his entire life trying to wipe out Christianity. 
He says to a friend, he says this, he wrote this down. He says, these impetuous Galileans, which he's referring to Christians, they support not only their poor, but ours as well. And all men see our lack of aid. You see, in the ancient world, the poor were seen as a drag on society. They were seen as a cancer that needed to be wiped out. In fact, women were often fined for outliving their husbands because it hurt the state. And then this movement began where a group of people began to willingly care and feed and support the poor. They helped the hurting, gave them a warm bed and food to eat. Why? Because this little group of people followed this man, Jesus, who said, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And so neighbors and communities, they began to notice and be drawn to these gatherings and followers of Jesus because of their support for the poor. Or today, many of us, we don't understand that the ancient world was a dark and brutal place. You see, today we celebrate and protect uh, groups like children, but that wasn't the way the ancient world worked. Back in the first century, there was this practice called exposure. Uh, One Roman writer on record said this. He says, we drown children at birth when they are unwanted and deformed. Now, you have to understand, this was not seen as cruel or evil. This statement, it wasn't even controversial back then. It was just the way the world worked. If a child was deformed or disabled, or if a child was of the unwanted sex. Any of you wanna guess which gender was known as the unwanted sex back then? It was girls, of course. See, these children, they were seen as disposable. In fact, in one of the most cultured cities of the ancient world, Ephesus, there was a large hill just outside the city and parents would take these undesirable children who were disabled or unwanted and they would place them on the hill and leave them to die. Can you imagine a world where that is practiced? Well, today we can't. Why is that? It's because at the end of the first century, a little group of people who followed this man, Jesus, began studying the words of Jesus. Because it was Jesus who said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. You see, these early followers, they remembered that it was women who Jesus first appeared to on Easter Sunday. And so, and so these early followers of Jesus, they began to journey to this hill where they would find these helpless, vulnerable children left to die. And they would pick them up, bring them into their homes and raise these children as their own. And so began the very first orphanages and hospitals in our world. You see, our world is different today because of the message of Jesus. To this day, followers of Jesus are five times, get this, five times more likely to adopt than people who do not follow Jesus. Why is that? Is it because they are better people or more moral? No. It's simply because they follow a man who said, truly, I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. A little over a year ago, we did an initiative to provide a better experience for the kids at Orangewood. Now, Orangewood is a home for at-risk boys and girls in our community. Well, as we were helping remodel some of their rooms, we were providing TVs because every kid needs a great TV for Netflix and video games. And one of the TVs we had delivered to Orangewood was broken. So one of our staff, a guy by the name of John, drove over to Best Buy to grab a new one. So he gets this TV, he gets to the counter, and instantly at the counter, this cashier, this girl, she's trying to upsell John on buying a bigger TV. She's like, hey, did you know, for just $50 more, you can get a way bigger TV? And he says like, no, I'm not interested. But she keeps pressing in. She's like, what's wrong with you, man? Like, who doesn't want a bigger TV and it's only $50? So eventually, John, he tells her, he's like, thanks, but we actually need a specific size because I'm part of this church that's helping remodel rooms at Orangewood. And it's important that every room has the same size TV, so it's fair. All of a sudden, this girl, she gets really quiet. And then in a whisper, she tells John, she's like, I had no idea. And then she pauses and tears begin to form in her eyes And she tells him, you know, my sister and I grew up in Orangewood. So I just want to say thank you. And to thank your church for caring about kids like us. Now, why does a story like this move us? 
It's because once there was a man named Jesus who lived, who taught, who changed our very world. You see this, this book right here. This book is not just a book of good morals. It's not just a book of inspirational stories. What we find in this book is this man, Jesus, who will change us to our very core. So can we trust this book? The answer is yes. But more importantly, does it matter? And the answer is more than you know. Because you see, it's in this book that we find the words of life. So I'll tell you, this weekend is a big weekend for our church because today we are launching a reading plan through the life of Jesus. So over the next seven weeks, over the next seven weeks, I'm going to challenge every single one of us to commit to reading this book. Now, we're going to read through the book of Luke and Acts. And Luke, the author of his gospel, his biography of Jesus, it starts this way. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. You see, the words of this book have been so carefully passed down to us from generation to generation. They come from eyewitnesses who saw Jesus with their own eyes, who heard the message of Jesus, who saw how he lived and how he died, and they experienced his resurrection and the hope he offers. So today, I want to invite you on a journey with us. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read through this book of Luke and Acts together. If you live in Orange County, I want to encourage you to jump into a group and read with us. You can find our reading plan on this page right here at thecrossing.com. And if you're in the area, I want to encourage you to show up because we're handing out these specific books, which is just Luke and Acts. And we're going to ask every single one of us to read through this together because we believe so strongly in the message of this book and the God who is behind it. So today, as I pray, I want to encourage you, whether you are brand new to faith or been around church for a while, in this season, I want to invite you to meet Jesus yet again. Let's pray. God, we thank you because you are such a good and gracious God. And as we see today, God, your word is trustworthy. It is dependable. It has been passed down with integrity for generation to generation. And God, it changes lives. So as we jump into this together, God, I pray that you change our lives. We love you and pray this in your son's name. Amen.